Fireside Tales with Wolfgang. Episode 23. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, CAPS Media Television Channel 6, KPPQLP Ventura at 104.1 FM, and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Greetings and salutations. I'm Hunter Ackerman, here to read some classic literature for you and my beastly feline companion, Wolfgang. So, Wolfus, what do you want to hear? This is... A Double-Eyed Deceiver by O. Henry. The trouble began in Laredo. It was the Yano kid's fault. It happened in old Justo Valdo's gambling house. There was a poker game in which sat players who were not all friends, as happens often where men ride in from afar to shoot folly as she gallops. There was a row over so small a matter as a pair of queens. And when the smoke had cleared away, it was found that the kid had committed an indiscretion, and his adversary had been guilty of a blunder. For the unfortunate combatant, instead of being a lowlife, was a high-blooded youth from the cow ranches of uh, about the kid's own age, and possessed of friends and a few champions. His blunder in missing the kid's right ear only a sixteenth of an inch when he pulled his gun did not lessen the indiscretion of the kid who was the better marksman. The Yano kid, not being equipped with personal admirers and supporters, considered it compatible with his shadowy reputation perform that judicious traditional act known as pulling his freight. And so he shot that young man dead on the spot. Quickly the Avengers gathered and sought him. Three of them overtook him within a few yards of the station. The kid turned and showed his teeth in that brilliant but mirthless smile that usually preceded his deeds of insolence and violence, and his pursuers fell back without making it necessary for him to even reach for his weapon. But in this affair, the kid had not felt the grim thirst for encounter that usually urged him on to battle. It had been a purely chance row, born of the cards and certain epithets impossible for a gentleman to brook that had passed between the two. The kid had rather liked the slim, haughty, brown-faced young chap whom his bullet had cut off in the first pride of manhood, and now he wanted no more blood. He just wanted to get away and have a good long sleep somewhere else, somewhere else with his Face in the sun. The kid openly boarded. The kid openly boarded the northbound passenger train that departed five minutes later. But at Webb, a few miles out where it was flagged to take on a traveler, he abandoned that manner of escape. There were telegraph stations ahead. The kid looked askance at electricity and steam. Saddle and spur were his rocks of safety. The man whom he had shot was a stranger to him, but the kid knew that he was of the Coralados outfit from Hildago, and that the punchers from that ranch were more relentless and vengeful than Kentucky feudists when wrong or harm was done one of them. So... With the wisdom that has characterized many great fighters, the Yano Kid decided to pile up as many leagues as possible of chaparral and pear between himself and the retaliation of the Coralitos bunch. Near the station was a store, and near the store, scattered among the mesquites and elms, stood the saddled horses of the customers. 
Now, most of them waited half asleep with sagging limbs and drooping heads, but one, a long-legged roan with a curved neck, snorted and pawed at the turf. This one, this horse, the kid mounted, gripped with his knees and slapped gently with the owner's own squirt. If the slaying of the reckless card player had cast a cloud over the kid standing as a good and true citizen, this last act of his put him in the darkest shadows of disrepute. On the Rio Grande border, if you take a man's life, you sometimes get by with it. But if you take his horse, you take a thing, the loss of which re re renders that man poor Indeed, in which enriches you not if you are caught. For the kid, for the kid, there was no turning back now. Because the hang horse thieves. With the spring and roan under him, he felt little care or uneasiness. After a five mile gallop, he drew into the plainsman's jog and trot and rode northeastward toward the Nuisi's river bottoms. He knew the country well. He knew its most torturous and obscure trails through the great wilderness of brush and pear, and its camps and lonesome ranches where one might find safe entertainment. Always he bore to the east, for the kid had never seen the ocean. Never seen the ocean and he had a fancy to lay his hand upon the mane of the great Gulf of Mexico, the gamesome cult of the greater waters. <sighs> so, after three days' ride, he stood on the shore at Corpus Christi, and he looked out across the gentle ripples of a quiet sea. Captain Boone of the schooner Fly Away stood near his skiff, which one of his crew was guarding in the surf. When ready to sail, he discovered that one of the necessaries of life, in the shape of plug tobacco, had been forgotten. A sailor had been dispatched for the missing cargo. Meanwhile, the captain placed the sands, chewing profanely at his pocket store. A slim, wiry youth in high-heeled boots came down to the water's edge. His face was boyish, but with a premature severity that hinted at a man's experience. His complexion was naturally dark, and the sun and wind of an outdoor life had burned it to a coffee brown. His hair was black and straight. His face had not yet been upturned to the humiliation of a razor. His eyes were a cold and steady blue. He carried his left arm somewhat away from his body, for pearl handle 45s are frowned upon by town marshals, and they're also a little bulky when placed in the left armhole of one's vest. He looked beyond Captain Boone at the gulf with the impersonal and expressionless dignity of a Chinese emperor. Thinking of buying that out there gulf, eh, buddy? Asked the captain, made sarcastic by his narrow escape of a tobaccoless voyage. Well, I know, said the kid gently. I reckon that. I just never saw it before. I was just looking at it. <laughs> not thinking of selling it, are you? Arr, not this trip, said the captain. I'll send it to you, COD, when I get back to Buenos Terrace. Here comes that lubber with the chewing tobacco. <laughs> I ought to have weighed anchor an hour ago. Is that your ship out there? Asked the kid. Why, yes, answered the captain. If you want to call a schooner a ship, and I don't mind lying, but you better say Miller and Gonzalez, owners and ordinary plain Billy be damned old Samuel K. Boone, the skipper. 
So, uh, where are y'all going to? Asked the refugee. Buenos Terras, coast of South America. I forgot what they called the country the last time I was there. Our cargo is lumber, corrugated iron, and machetes. What kind of country is it? Asked the kid. Is it hot or cold? Warmish, buddy, said the captain. But a regular paradise lost for elegance of scenery and beauty of geography. We're wakened every morning by the sweet singing of red birds with seven purple tails and the sign of breezes and the posies and roses. And the inhabitants never work for they can reach out and they can pick steamer baskets of the hottest choice hothouse fruits without getting out of bed. And there's no Sunday and no ice and no rent and no troubles and no use, and no nothing. It's a great country for a man to go to sleep with and wait for something to turn up. The bananas and oranges and pineapples, hell, the hurricanes, all those fruits that you eat, they all come from there. Well, that sounds pretty good to me, said the kid, at last betraying interest. What'll the expressage be to take me out there with you? Twenty-four dollars, said Captain Boone. Grub and transportation, second cabin. I haven't got a first cabin. Well, you got my company, said the kid, pulling out a buckskin bag. With $300, he had gone to Laredo for his regular blowout. The duel at Vallejo's gambling house had cut short his season of hilarity, but it had left him with nearly $200 that he hadn't lost yet for aid in the flight that had made it necessary. All right, buddy, said the captain. I hope your ma won't blame me for this little childish escapade of yours. He beckoned to one of the boat's crew. Let Sanchez lift you up to the skiff so you don't get your pretty feet wet. Thacker. Thacker. The United States Consul at Buenos Terrace was not yet drunk. It was only 11 o'clock in the morning, and he never arrived at his desired state of beatitude, a state wherein he sang ancient maudlin vaudeville songs and pelted his screaming parrot with banana peels until the middle of the afternoon. So, when he looked up from his hammock at the sound of a slight cough and saw the kid standing in the door of the consulate, he was still in a condition to extend the hospitality and courtesy due from the representative of a great nation. Hey, uh, don't disturb yourself there, said the kid easily. I just dropped in. They told me it was customary to light at your camp for starting in to round up the town. I just came in on a ship straight out of Texas. Glad to see you, Mr. Um, said the console. The kid laughed. Sprague Dalton, he said. Sounds funny to me to hear it. I'm the call the Yano kid in the Rio Grande country. I'm Thacker, said the console. Take that cane bottom chair. Now, if you've come to invest, you want somebody to advise you. These people will cheat you out of the gold in your teeth if you don't understand their ways. Try a cigar? Uh, much obliged, said the kid. But if it wasn't for my corn shucks and the little bag in my back pocket, I couldn't live a minute. 
he took out his makings and he rolled himself what they call a cigarette. They speak Spanish here, said the console. You'll need an interpreter. If there's anything I can do, I, I'd be delighted, sir. If you're buying fruit, or if you're buying fruit lands, or looking for a concession of any sort, you'll want somebody who knows the ropes to look out for you. I speak Spanish, said the kid. About nine times better than I do English. <laughs> everybody, everybody speaks it out on the range where I come from, and besides, I'm not in the market for nothing. You speak Spanish, said Thacker thoughtfully. He regarded the kid absorbedly. You look like a Spaniard too, he continued. And you're from Texas. And you can't be more than 20 or maybe 21. I wonder, I wonder if you have any nerve. <laughs> you got a deal of some kind to put through? Asked the Texan with unexpected shrewdness. Are you open to a proposition? Said Thacker. What's the use tonight? Said the kid. I got into a little gun frolic down in Laredo and plugged a man. So now I'll come down to your parrot and monkey range just for to smell the morning glories and the marigolds. Now, do you sabe? Thacker got up and closed the door. Let me see your hand, he said. He took the little kid's left hand and examined the back of it closely. I can do it, he said excitedly. Your flesh is as hard as wood and as healthy as a baby's. It will heal in a week. Look, 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 look. If it's a fist fight you want me to back you up for, said the kid, don't put up your money just yet. Make it gun work and I'll keep you company, but no bare hands scrapping like ladies at a tea party. None of that from me. It's easier than that, said Thacker. Just step here, will you? Through the window, he pointed to a two-story white stuccoed house with wide galleries rising amid the deep green tropical foliage on a wooded hill that sloped gently from the sea. In that house, said Thacker, a fine old Castilian gentleman and his wife are yearning to gather you into their arms and fill your pockets with money. Old Santos Eureke lives there. He owns half the gold mines in all the country. You ain't been eating no loco weed, have you? Asked the kid. Sit down again, said Thacker, and I'll tell you all about it. Twelve years ago, they lost a kid. No, no, he didn't die. He was a wild little devil, even if he wasn't but eight years old. Everybody knows about it. Some Americans who were through here prospecting from gold had letters to Signor Eureke, and the boy was a favorite with them. They filled his head with big stories about the States, and about a month after they left, the kid disappeared too. He was supposed to have stowed himself away among the banana bunches on a fruit steamer and gone to New Orleans. He was seen once afterwards in Texas, it was thought, but they never heard anything more of him. Old Eureke has spent thousands of dollars having him looked for. The madam was broken up worst of all. The kid was her life. She wears mourning garb yet. But they say she believes he'll come back to her someday and never gives up hope. On the back of the boy's left hand was tattooed a flying eagle carrying a spear in its claws. That's old Eureke's coat of arms or something that he inherited from Spain. 
The kid raised his left hand slowly and gazed at it a little curiously. That's it, said Thacker, reaching behind the official desk for his bottle of smuggled brandy. You're not so slow. I can do it. What was I consul at Sundakan for? I never knew till now. In a week, I will have the eagle bird with the frog sticker blended in so that you'd think you were born with it. I was born a set of the needles and ink just bef- because I was sure you would drop in some day, Mr. Dalton. Aw, oh, hell, said the kid. I thought I told you my name. All right, then. Kid, if you prefer. It won't be that long. How does Senorito Enrique sound for a change? Well, I never played son any that I remember of, said the kid. If I had any parents to mention, they were over the divide by the time I gave my first bleat. What is the plan of your roundup? Well, Thacker leaned back against the wall and held his glass up to the light. We've come now, said he, to the question of how far you're willing to go in a little matter of the sort. I told you why I came down here, said the kid, simply. A good answer said the console, but you won't have to go that far. Here's the scheme. After I get the trademark tattooed on your hand, I'll notify old Eureke. In the meantime, I'll furnish you with all the family history I can find out so you can be studying up points to talk about. You've got the looks. You speak the Spanish. You know the facts. You can tell about Texas. You will have the tattoo mark then. When I notify them that the rightful heir has returned and is waiting to know whether he will be received and pardoned, what will happen? They'll simply rush down here and fall on you, and the curtain goes down for refreshments and a stroll in the lobby. I'm waiting, said the kid. I haven't had my saddle off in your camp long, partner. And I ain't never met you before, but if you intend to let it go at a parental blessing, well, I'm mistaken in my man, and that's all. I think there's more to your game. Thanks, said the consul. I haven't met anybody in a long time that keeps up with an argument half as well as you do, Mr. Kidd. The rest of it is simple. If they take you out, if they take you in only for a little while, it's long enough. Don't give them time enough to hunt up the strawberry mark on your left shoulder. Old Eureka keeps anywhere from $50,000 to $100,000 in his house all the time in a little safe that you could open with a shoehorn. Get it? My skill as a tattooer is worth half of the boodle. We go in halves and catch a tramp steamer for Rio de Janeiro that the United States go to pieces if it can't get along without my services. Que dice, senor? Hmm. Sounds pretty good to me, said the kid, nodding his head. I'm out for the dust. All right, then, said Thacker. You'll have to keep close until we get the bird on you. Then you can live in the back room from here. I do all my own cooking, and I'll make you as comfortable as a parsimonious government will allow me. Thacker had set the time in a week, but it was two weeks before the design that he had patiently tattooed upon the kid's hand was to his notion. And then Thacker called a messenger and dispatched this note to the intended victim. 
el señor Don Santos Eurique, La Casa Blanca. My dear sir, I beg permission to inform you that there is in my house, as a temporary guest, a young man who arrived in Buenos Aires from the United States some days ago. Without wishing to excite any hopes that may not be realized, I think there is a possibility of his being your long-absent son. It might be well for you to call and see him if he is. It is in my opinion that his intention was to return to his home, but upon arriving here, his courage failed him from doubts as to how he would be received. Your true servant, Thompson Thacker. Half an hour afterward, quick time for Buenos Terrace. Senor Eureka's ancient Landau drove the consul's door with the barefooted coachman beating and shouting at the team of horses. A tall man with a white mustache alighted and assisted to the ground a lady who was dressed and veiled in unrelieved black. The two hastened inside and were met by Thacker with his best diplomatic bow. By his desk stood a slender young man with a clear-cut sun-browned features and smoothly brushed black hair. Senora Eureka threw back her black veil with a quick gesture. She was past middle age and her hair was beginning to silver, but her full and proud figure was clear olive skin, retained traces of the beauty peculiar to the Basque province. But once you had seen her eyes, and comprehended the great sadness that was revealed in their deep shadows and their hopeless expression. You saw that the woman lived only in some memory. She bent upon the young man a look of the most agonizing questioning. Then her black eyes turned and her gaze rested upon his left hand and with a sob, not too loud, but seeming to shake the room, she cried, Hijo mio! and caught the Yano kid to her heart. It's okay, buddy. A month afterward, the kid came to the consulate in response to a message sent by Thacker. He already looked the part of a young Spanish caballero. His clothes were imported, and the wiles of the jewelers had not been spent upon him in vain. A more than respectable diamond shone on his finger as he rolled a cigarette. What's doing? asked Thacker. Nothing much, said the kid calmly. I eat my first iguana steak today. They're them big lizards, you sabe. I reckon, though, that frijoles and side bacon would do me about as well. Do you care for iguanas, Thacker? No, no, nor for any other kinds of reptiles, said Thacker. It was three in the afternoon. In another hour, he'd be in his state of beatitude. It's time you were making good, Sonny. He went on with an ugly look on his reddened face. You are not playing up to me square. You've been the prodigal son for four weeks now. And you could have had veal for every meal on a gold dish if you had wanted it. Now, Mr. Kidd... Do you think it's right to leave me out so long on this husk diet? What's the trouble? Don't you get your filial eyes on anything that looks like cash in the Casablanca? Don't tell me you don't. 
Everybody knows where old Eureka keeps his stuff. It's U.S. currency, too. He don't accept anything else. What's he doing? Don't tell me nothing this time. Why, sure, said the kid, admiring his diamond. There's plenty of money up there. I'm no judge of collateral in bunches, but I will undertake for to say that I seen the rise of $50,000 at a time in that tin grub box that my adopted father calls his safe. And he lets me carry the key sometimes just to show me that he knows that I'm the real little Francisco that strayed away from the herd such a long time ago. Well, what are you waiting for? asked Thacker angrily. Don't you forget that I can upset your apple cart any day I want to. If old Eureka knew you were an imposter, what sort of things would happen to you? Oh, you don't know this country, mister. Texas kid. The laws here have got mustard spread between them. These people here would stretch you out like a frog that had been stepped on and give you about 50 sticks at every corner of the plaza and they'd wear every stick out just beating you what was left of you that they had not yet fed the alligators. A mud just as well tell you now, partner, said the kid, sliding down low on his steamer chair. The things are going to stay just as they are. They're about right for now. What do you mean? asked Thacker, rattling the bottom of his glass on his desk. Listen here. Pretty simple. The scheme's off said the kid. And wherever you have the pleasure of speaking to me, you will address me as Don Francisco Eureka. I guarantee I'll answer to it. We are going to let Colonel Eureka keep his money. His little tin safe is as good as the time locker in the First National Bank of Laredo as far as you and me are concerned. You're going to throw me down then, are you? Asked the console. Huh. Sure, said the kid cheerfully. Throw you down. That's it. And now? Now I'll tell you why. The first night I was up at the colonel's house, they introduced me to a bedroom. No blankets on the floor. A real bedroom with a bed and things in it. And before I was asleep, in comes this artificial mother of mine and tucks in the covers. Panchito, she says. My, my little lost one. God has brought you back to me. I bless his name forever. It was that or some truck like it, she said. And down comes a drop or two of rain. And hits me on the nose. And all that stuck by me, Mr. Thacker. And it's been that way ever since. And it's got to stay that way. Now, don't you think... Don't you think that it's some kind of villainy inside me that makes me say that kind of thing? If you got any sort of ideas, you just keep them to yourself. I haven't had much truck with women in my life and no mother to speak of. But... Here's a lady. Oh, here's a lady that we gotta keep fooled. Once she stood for it. Twice she won't. I hope you're listening close. Cause I'm a low down wolf. And the devil may have sent me on this trail. But I'll travel it to the end. Now. Don't forget... 
that I'm Don Francisco Eureka whenever you happen to mention my name. I'll expose you today, you you double-dyed traitor, stammered Thacker. The kid arose, and without violence, the kid calmly took Thacker by the throat with a hand of steel and shoved him slowly into a corner. Then he drew from under his left arm his pearl-handled forty-five and he placed the cold muzzle of it against the console's mouth. I told you why I come here, he said with his old freezing smile. And if I ever leave, killing you will have been the reason. Never forget that, partner. Now, what is my name? Er, Don Francisco Eureka, gasped Thacker. From outside came a sound of wheels and the shouting of someone and the sharp thwacks of a wooden whipstock upon the backs of fat horses. The kid put up his gun and walked to the door. But he turned again and came back to the trembling Thacker and held up his left hand with its back toward the console. There's one more reason, he said slowly why things have got to stand as they are. The feller I killed in Laredo had one of them same pictures on his left hand. Outside, the ancient Landau of Don Santos Eureka rattled to the door. The coachman ceased his bellowing. Senora Eureka, in a voluminous gown of white lace and flying ribbons, leaned forward with a happy look in her great soft eyes. Are you within, dear son? She called in the rippling Castilian lisp. Madre mia, yo vengo. Mother, mother, I come, answered the young Don Francisco Eureka. This is The Skylight Room by O. Henry. First, Mrs. Parker would show you the double parlors. You would not dare to interrupt her description of their advantages and of the merits of the gentleman who had occupied them for eight years. Then you would manage to stammer forth the confession that you were neither a doctor nor a dentist. Mrs. Parker's manner of receiving the admission was such that you could never afterward entertain the same feeling toward your parents who had neglected to bring you up in one of those professions that fitted Mrs. Parker's parlors. So next, you ascended one flight of stairs and looked at the second floor back room at $8. Convinced by her second floor manner, that it was worth the $12 that Mr. Tootsenbury always paid for it until he left to take charge of his brother's orange plantation in Florida near Palm Beach, where Mrs. McIntyre always spent the winters that had double front room with a private bath. You managed to babble that you wanted something still cheaper. If you survived Mrs. Parker's scorn, you were taken to look at Mrs. Mr. Skidder's large hall room on the third floor. Mr. Skidder's room was not vacant. He wrote plays and smoked cigarettes in it all day long. But every room hunter was made to visit his room and admire the lambrequins 
like these hanging drape things that you just sort of put over doors. <clears throat> After each visit, Mr. Skidder, from the fright caused by possible eviction, would pay something on his rent. Then, oh, then, if you still stood on one foot with your hot hand clutching the three moist dollars in your pocket and hoarsely proclaim your hideous and culpable poverty, never more would Miss Parker be Cicerone of yours. She would honk loudly the name Clara and show you her back and march downstairs. Then Clara... The colored maid would escort you up the carpeted ladder that served for the fourth flight and show you the skylight room. It occupied seven by eight feet of floor space at the middle of the hall. On each side of it was a dark wooded panel, closet, or storeroom. In it was an iron cot, a washstand, and a chair. A shelf was the dresser. Its four bare walls seemed to close in upon you like the sides of a coffin. Your hand crept to your throat. You gasped. You looked up as if from a well and breathed once more. Through the glass of the little skylight, you saw a square of blue infinity. Two dollars, uh, Clara would say in her half-contemptuous half Tuscogenial tones. <clears throat> One day, Miss Leeson came hunting for a room. She carried a typewriter made to be lugged about by a much larger lady. She was a very little girl with eyes and hair that had kept on growing after she had stopped. She kind of looked like a Disney character. And she, her eyes always looked as if they were saying, Goodness me, why didn't you keep up with us? Mrs. Parker showed her the double parlors. In this closet, she said, one could keep a skeleton or anesthetic or coal. Miss Leeson said with a shiver, But I'm neither a doctor nor a dentist. Mrs. Parker gave her the incredulous, pitying, sneering, icy stare that she kept for those who failed to qualify as doctors or dentists and led the way to the second floor back. Eight dollars? said Miss Leeson. Dear me, I, I, I'm not heady if I do look green. I, I'm just a Poor little working girl. Show me something higher and lower. Mr. Skidder jumped and strewed the floor with cigarette stubs at the rap on his door. Excuse me, Mr. Skidder, said Mrs. Parker with her demon's smile at his pale looks. Ah, uh, I didn't know you were in. I asked the lady to have a look at your lambrequins. They're too lovely for anything, said Miss Leeson, smiling in exactly, in exactly the way angels do. After they had gone, Mr. Skidder got very busy erasing the tall, black-haired heroine from his latest unproduced play and inserting a very small, charming heroine with heavy, bright hair and vivacious features. <clears throat> Anna Held will jump at this, said Mr. Skidder to himself, putting his feet up against the lambrequins and disappearing in a cloud of smoke like an aerial cuttlefish. Presently, the tuxen call of Clara sounded to the world the state of Miss Leeson's purse. A dark goblin seized her, mounted a Stygian stairway, thrust her into a vault with a glimmer of light in its top, and muttered the menacing and cabalistic words, Two dollars. I'll take it, 
sighed Miss Leeson, slinking down upon the squeaky iron bed. Every day, Miss Leeson went out to work. At night, she brought home papers with handwriting on them and made copies with her typewriter. Sometimes, she had no work at night, and then she would sit on the steps of the high stoop with the other roomers. Miss Leeson was not intended for a skylight room when the plans were drawn for her creation. She was happy. She was light-hearted. She was full of tender, whimsical fantasies. Once she let Mr. Skidder read to her three acts of his great unpublished comedy. It's No Kid or The Heir of the Subway. There was rejoicing among the gentlemen rumors whenever Miss Leeson had time to sit on the steps for an hour or two, but Miss Longnecker was a really tall blonde who taught in a public school and said, well, really, to everything anyone said, the same Miss Longnecker sat on the top step and sniffed. Mm. And Miss Dorn, Miss Dorn, who shot at the moving ducks at Coney, it's like little mechanical things you shoot on with a, like a pellet gun sort of thing. They're not real ducks. But Miss Dorn, who shot at the moving ducks at Coney every Sunday and worked in a department store, sat on the bottom step and sniffed. Miss Leeson sat on the middle step, and all the men would quickly group around her. Especially Mr. Skidder, who had cast her in his mind for the star in a private, romantic, unspoken drama in real life. And especially Mr. Hoover, who was 45, fat, flush, and foolish. Oh, and especially very young Mr. Evans, who set up a hollow cough to induce her to ask him to leave off of cigarettes. The men voted her the funniest and jolliest ever, but the sniffs on the top step and the lower step were implacable. <clears throat> I pray you, let the drama halt while the chorus stalks to the footlights and drops an epicedean tear upon the fatness of Mr. Hoover. Tune the pipes to the tragedy of tallow, the bane of bulk, the calamity of corpulence. Try it out, Falstaff might have rendered more romance to the ton than would have Romeo's rickety ribs to the ounce. A lover may sigh, but he must not puff. To the train of mamas are the fat men remended. In vain beats the faithfulest heart above a 52-inch belt. Avant, Hoover. Hoover, 45, flush and foolish, might carry off Helen herself. Hoover, 45, flush, foolish, and fat? He is meat for perdition. There was never a chance for you, Hoover. <clears throat> As Mrs. Parker's rumors sat thus one summer's evening, Miss Leeson looked up into the firmament and cried with her little gay laugh, What? There's Billy Jackson. I can see him from down here, too. All looked up, some at the windows of skyscrapers, some casting about for an airship, Jackson guided. It's... That star, explained Miss Leeson, pointing with a tiny finger. Not the big one that twinkles, the steady blue one near it. I can see it every night through my skylight. I named it Billy Jackson. Well, really, said Miss Longnecker. I didn't know you were an astronomer, Miss Leeson. Oh, yes said the small stargazer. I know as much as any of them about the style of sleeves they're going to wear next fall in Mars. Well, really, said Miss Longnecker. 
The star you refer to is Gamma of the constellation Cassiopeia. It is nearly of the second magnitude, and its meridian passage is... Oh, said the very young Mr. Evans. I think Billy Jackson is a much better name for it. Same here, said Mr. Hoover, loudly breathing defiance to Miss Longnecker. I think Miss Leeson has just as much a right to name stars as any of those old astrologers had. Well, really, said Miss Longnecker. <clears throat> I wonder whether it's a shooting star, remarked Miss Dorn. I hit nine ducks and a rabbit out of ten in the gallery at Coney on Sunday. He doesn't show up very well from down here, said Miss Leeson. You ought to see him from my room. You know, you can see stars even at daytime from the bottom of the well. At, at, at night, my room is like the shaft of a coal mine, and it makes Billy Jackson look like the big diamond pin that night fastens her kimono with. There came a time after that when Miss Leeson brought no formidable papers home to copy. And when she went out in the morning, instead of working, she went from office to office and let her heart melt away in the drip of cold refusals transmitted through insolent office boys. And this went on. There came an evening when she wearily climbed Mrs. Parker's stoop at the hour when she always returned from her dinner at the restaurant. But she had had no dinner. As she stepped into the hall, Mr. Hoover met her and seized his chance. He asked her to marry him, and his fatness hovered above her like an avalanche. She dodged and caught the balustrade. He tried for her hand, and she raised it and smote him weakly in the face. Step by step, she went on went upstairs, dragging herself by the railing. She passed Mr. Skidder's door as he was red-inking a stage direction for Myrtle Delorme, who's Miss Leeson's character. In his unaccepted comedy, to pirouette across from left to the side of the Count. Up the carpeted ladder, she crawled at last and opened the door of the skylight room. She was too weak to light the lamp or to undress. She fell upon the iron cot, her fragile body scarcely hollowing the worn springs. And in that Erebus of the skylight room, she slowly raised her heavy eyelids and smiled for Billy Jackson was smiling down upon her, calm and bright and constant through the skylight. There was no world about her. She was sunk in a pit of blackness, but with that small square of pallid light framing the star that she had so whimsically and oh so ineffectually named, Miss Longnecker must be right. It was Gamma of the constellation Cassiopeia and not Billy Jackson. And yet, she could not let it be Gamma. As she lay on her back, she tried twice to raise her arm. The third time, she got two thin fingers to her lips and blew a kiss out of the black pit to Billy Jackson. Her arm fell back limply. Goodbye, Billy, she murmured faintly. You're millions of miles away, and you won't even twinkle once. But you kept where I could see you most of the time up there, when there wasn't anything else but darkness to look at, didn't you? Millions of miles. Goodbye, Billy Jackson. Clara, the maid, found the door locked at ten the next day, and they forced it open. 
vinegar and the slapping of wrists and burnt feathers proving of no avail, someone ran to phone for an ambulance. In due time, it backed up to the door with much gong clanging and the capable young medico in his white linen coat, ready, active, confident with his smooth face, half debonair, half grim, danced up the steps. Ambulance call to 49, he said briefly. What's the trouble? Oh, 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 yes, doctor, sniffed Mrs. Parker, as though her trouble in the house was the greater. I can't think what can be the matter with her. Nothing we could do or bring her to. It's a young woman, Miss Elise. Yes, um, young Miss Elise Leeson. Never before in my house. What room? cried the doctor in a terrible voice to which Miss Parker was a stranger. Uh, the skylight room. It, it, evidently, the ambulance doctor was familiar with the location of skylight rooms. He was gone up the stairs, four at a time. Mrs. Parker followed slowly as her dignity demanded. On the first landing, she met him coming back, bearing the astronomer in her arms. He stopped and let loose the practiced scalpel of his tongue, but not loudly. Gradually, Mrs. Parker crumpled as a stiff garment that slips down from a nail. Ever afterward, there remained crumples in her mind and body. Sometimes her curious rumors would ask her what the doctor said to her. Let that be, she would answer. If I can get forgiveness for having heard it, I will be satisfied. The ambulance physician strode with his burden through the pack of hounds that follow the curiosity chase, and even they fell back along the sidewalk abashed, for his face was that of one who bears his own dead. They noticed that he did not lay her down upon the prepared bed, and all that he said was, drive like hell, Wilson, to the driver. That is all. Is it a story? In the next morning's paper, I saw a little news item, and the last sentence of it might help you, as it helped me to weld the incidences together. It recounted the reception into Bellevue Hospital of a young woman who had been removed from number 49 East Street suffering from debility induced by starvation. It concluded with these words. Dr. William Jackson, the ambulance physician who attended the case, says the patient will recover. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Fireside Tales with Wolfgang. To view more of my work, Check out my YouTube channel at Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Directed by Hunter Ackerman. Endorsed by Wolfgang Beastly. Produced by GWC Productions. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, CAPS Media Television Channel 6, KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM, and on the KPPQ Podcast Network.